What's up kitten cats? Welcome back to my channel. So today we are here for part one of a two-part video and we're talking about methods of measuring body composition, you know, body fat, percent lean mass, all of that good happy stuff. So a little bit of backstory for this. I recently got a DEXA scan. Well, not that recently. It was about a month ago, um, but these videos are going to be very time intensive to record and edit and all of that stuff. So it's taken me a little while to do these. That's just the reality of my life. Anyway, so I got a DEXA scan and I was like, I'm going to do a video sharing the results, da, 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 da. And I was sitting down, I have my notes here for part one, and I got three pages in to just the like background. And I was like, okay, would you guys rather have one very long, like, probably 40 minute video where I go over all of the background and then my personal test results or would you rather have them split into two with each of them probably being around 20 or so minutes and you guys it was a very close margin but you guys said split it into two so that's what we're doing so this first video is going to be a lot of background this is going to be very information heavy and it's going to be more of what I would consider like a lecture style video uh, in the sense of what you're going to get out of this it's not going to be talking about my personal experience really at all. Uh, just going over why I chose a DEXA scan, why DEXA scans are seen as the gold standard, what other options out there are, all of that stuff. Uh, so that's it. So this video is going to be all that background info and then the following video will be more of a discussion of my personal results, all that good stuff. So I am going to touch a little bit on in this video and I'll probably touch on it in the next one as well, why I personally chose to have a DEXA scan done. Uh, so. I wrapped up my reverse diet right before I got my DEXA scan done. So we can say, get this out of the way, it probably would have been the most accurate if I had gotten the DEXA scan done immediately at the end of the fat loss phase that I was in. Um, because even within, you know, the time frame between when I ended the diet and when I got my DEXA scan, there's probably a little bit of glycogen replenishment, things like that. So the reading is probably not 100%. It's accurate to where I was in that exact moment, but if I wanted you know, really precise exact data from where I ended that fat loss phase. I should have done it immediately. <laughs> or like right before I ended it, um, but I didn't do that. So what we have is what we have. And the reason that I did that is I'm a data nerd. I really, <laughs> hashtag jacked and nerdy. I am very much so a data nerd and I knew that, okay, the end of this dieting phase and then this reverse diet is gonna happen and it is happening. And then after that is when I will ideally be starting a prep for the 2020 season and then going throughout that prep season. So I wanted to be able to have data points from different phases throughout. So where I ended this dieting phase and then I wanna be able to have repeated data, you know, however long into the reverse, and then at the end of the reverse or the beginning of prep, and then throughout prep. So I just want to have comparable data so that I can look at how things have changed over time. That's just the kind of person I am. It's really interesting to me. I feel like there's going to be some of you out there that are very interested in that kind of content. So uh, it's great to help evaluate kind of where I'm at within the goals that I have for myself, particularly within this reverse diet and also within, you know, a future prep. But my one of my big goals for this reverse diet is to stay around the body composition that I ended my dieting phase at. Obviously, there will be some weight and body fat along with muscle tissue added, uh, but not straying too far from where I ended just because where I ended was a great within a great striking range to healthily start a contest prep from. Um, so by getting repeat DEXA scans, I will be able to see, you know, kind of where I'm at as far as the goals that I have, uh, particularly that goal. And then within something like a contest prep, it'll allow me to monitor, hey, uh, how much muscle tissue am I losing? How much body fat am I losing? How's my bone density doing? All of those things. I do have quite a few notes here. Uh, so if you see me like looking down, I don't have this memorized. I did not rehearse this. So I have notes. So that's what we'll be doing here today. So let's get into it. So my undergraduate degree is in exercise science and we actually had an entire class on I think it was called like fitness assessment and prescription and a lot of what we did in there uh, was just learning different assessment methods and we did have an entire unit on body composition measurement. So 
and all of the different forms, all of the different pros, cons, all of the different factors with different methods of body composition measurements. So essentially what we're going to be doing today is diving into that. So we're going to start with the concept of direct versus indirect body composition measurement. The only type of body composition measurement we can do on living creatures is indirect. So <laughs> there is no 100% accurate direct measure of body composition in humans because that would have to be done on a cadaver. And a cadaver is dead. <laughs> so that really wouldn't give us any thing. All methods of body composition measurement in living human beings are considered indirect. Now within that, we have what's called indirect and then doubly indirect. So it's considered indirect is derived from a direct method and then doubly indirect is derived from an indirect. And we'll kind of get a little bit more into that when we get more specific with the types of body composition measurements, so that'll make more sense. Um, but just note, keep in mind, the forms of body composition measurement that are considered doubly indirect have the highest margins of error, so they're going to be the least accurate. And I do believe that in terms of research, anything, I, I'm, I might not be 100% correct in this, this is just what I like recall from lecture, I think anything that is more than a plus or minus 3.5% range of error is not considered in research. Like they try to keep to methods that are within plus or minus three and a half percent accuracy. So what that means is let's just use a super easy number. Let's say somebody's body fat, like a female was read at 20%. So if there's a plus or minus three and a half percent error, that means that that female could be anywhere, even though it was read at 20%, that female could be anywhere from 16.5% to 23.5%. Now, so we have direct versus indirect, and then we have indirect and doubly indirect. So now there's what are called different compartment models of body composition. So basically, this is just, hey, how many like types of bodily compartments does this method of body composition measurement measure? So we have two compartment models, and then we have three to four compartment models. With two compartment models, all it measures is fat mass and fat free mass. Now with fat free mass, it can be literally anything that's not body fat. So that means muscle, that means bone, that means water, that means your organs. Everything that's not fat is considered fat free mass. Makes a lot of sense. And then getting into the three and four compartment models, these measure fat free mass, fat mass, and then potential other compartments, including things like bone mineral density and total body water. Three and four compartment models are super helpful just because it's a, another layer deeper, right? So it's another piece that we can put into the hole. It's another part to the hole. So we can get a better idea of, hey, how much of that lean mass is actually muscle mass versus just total lean mass when we have values for other lean tissues like total body water and bone mineral density. And then another thing that's really important to consider is just how important bone mineral density is. So that's really important for your overall health. I actually think that that's how DEXA scans were originally just intended for use was measuring body composition but specifically bone density. Uh, so especially for females since we are more prone to osteoporosis, osteopenia with things like menopause uh, or long stretches of amenorrhea, we do risk bone mineral density loss. So having something like a DEXA scan can give you an idea of, hey, where is my bone density at? How am I doing there just from a health perspective? So it's a piece of not just body composition data, but also just general health data. And as I stated before, anything that is more than a three and a half percent margin of error is generally not used by research just due to a lack of accuracy. So let's dive into some of the most popular or common forms of body composition measurement. So the first example that we're going to use here, the first method of body composition measurement are skin folds. So skin folds are where they take those little pinchy calipers and do them over, I believe it's either five or seven sites on your body body if you uh, it might actually be three this is considered a two compartment doubly indirect model so two compartment model doubly indirect greater margin of error so with that two compartment model we're only getting fat mass and fat free mass which you can get a percentage of total body fat from that so that is helpful but also the accuracy of your skin fold reading is largely dependent on the person that is taking your skin fold measurements so if you have someone that is extremely skilled at skin fold measurements they've been doing this for years and years and years you can actually get a very accurate reading within like that it can be as accurate as that plus or minus three and a half percent if you have someone that's very skilled but if you don't 
the accuracy goes way down. Um, so it's really dependent on the accuracy of the person, person measuring you. And it is generally not the most accurate unless you have a very skilled practitioner. But a pro to it is it is very easily accessible, relatively inexpensive. Uh, and you don't require anything like a hydrostatic weighing tank or a DEXA machine in order to do it. The next method we're going to talk about is bioelectrical impedance or BIA. So this is considered a three compartment doubly indirect <laughs> method of body composition measurement. So it divides your body into fat mass, fat free mass, and then total body water. So BIA relies on the electrical conductivity of various tissues within your body. So basically muscle has more water than fat mass does. So making it more electrically conductive. I think conductive is a word. <laughs> I actually am not sure. Muscle is about better conductor of electricity than fat mass. So basically the more conductive your tissues, the less impotence and the lower your body fat percentage. The accuracy of BIA is largely dependent on the method. So some different examples of BIA. We have the most accurate, which is the electrode placement model, which is where you get you lay down on a table and you get little electrodes placed throughout the length of your body. That is seen as the most accurate form of BIA. Others that are less accurate, and I would argue you should probably just throw out <laughs> are things like handheld devices, things like scales. So I know those scales that measure your body fat that influencers make commission on are super popular and they're super inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> very inaccurate so basically when you stand on one of those scales like you could literally like I did an experiment with this once because a company sent it to me and I was like I'm not actually gonna promote this I I'm just going to try it just so you know but you could literally drink a glass of water you could get on the scale you could drink a glass of water get back on and it'll tell you you've gained body fat you literally just drink water like that's it you could hold an object that is not fat but it has a weight and it's going to tell you that you have a higher body fat reading than you do. So these things are, they're not accurate. And some people are like, well, you can use that as a gauge. And I'm like, not really. Uh, <laughs> anyway, also with something like BIA, one limitation to consider is that these are highly impacted by hydration status. So hydration status can play a huge role in your reading, even with the very accurate electrode placement model. So just make sure you are adequately hydrated when you go in, like obviously don't do this after you've been dehydrated from a weekend of drinking or something like that, because your hydration status, because that is a lot of how BIA works is through water and the conductivity of different tissues. If your hydration status changes from reading to reading, then you're going to get less accurate readings, if that makes sense. But in terms of ranges of error, the most accurate forms of BIA can be as accurate as plus or minus 2.7%, and then the least accurate can be as inaccurate as 6.3%. So that 6.3 is a, a pretty hefty margin of error. So up next we have hydrodensiometry or hydrostatic weighing or the water displacement method. So this is considered a two compartment indirect. So we are now one step higher. Indirect method. Hydrostatic weighing is based on Archimedes principle of water displacement. So an object's weight in water is equal to the amount of water displaced along with what we know about tissue density. So fat tissue is less dense than water, meaning the fatter you are, the more buoyant you are aka you float more and I don't use the word fat as an insult it's just a descriptor so if you're butt hurt by me saying fatter you're not in the right place and then fat free mass is more dense than water so the leaner you are or the more lean tissue you have the less point you are in water and you sink more so if you are the same scale weight but have more fat free mass you will weigh more in water than someone of the same weight but with less lean tissue and more fat mass because you will displace more water. I hope that makes sense. One limitation of hydrostatic weighing is there are a lot of calculations involved. Also hydrostatic weighing tanks are massive <laughs> and they're not just something that you're going to see in a commercial gym. You only see them usually in like research type settings like universities. Like we actually had hydrostatic weighing tanks at the University of Louisville. So there are a lot of calculations involved. You have dry weight and height. You have the final underwater weight. You have the weight of the chair without the subject. You have the temperature and density of the water within the tank. You have residual volume predictions, which are 
the predictions of the amount of air left in your lungs after a full exhale, which we'll get into in a second. Um, and then you have body fat calculated or body fat percent calculated based on body density using either a Siri or a Brozac equation. So that's a lot. The accuracy of hydrostatic weighing when done well, both by the subject and all of the different equations and variables involved that the practitioner would have to take care of. The accuracy is pretty high with plus or minus 2.7%. But note that most of the error comes from the subject or the person being tested. So in a hydrostatic weighing tank, you have to be fully submersed underwater and you have to try and expel as much of your air as possible, leaving ideally only that residual volume left in your lungs. So one of the big limitations of this type of body composition measurement is people get like very nervous and they can't expel all of their air because that's highly uncomfortable, right? Like they get underwater and they'll maybe expel the majority of their air, but there's still that little bit left that will impact your reading. Um, another situation is hydration status does affect this. Uh, also, if you have like, if you've recently eaten something that could make you gassy and put gas in your stomach, uh, the amount of food volume left in your stomach after your the last meal that you had, those kind of things, that's where the majority of error within hydrostatic weighing comes into place is with the subject. So just keep that in mind. If you are somebody that's going to do a hydrostatic weighing test, make sure that you're well hydrated, make sure that you haven't recently eaten something that can make you super gassy, uh, and also make sure that you feel comfortable and they do do repeat like, You'll go into the water, it'll measure it, and you'll come back out, and then you'll go into the water and measure it and come back out and all that stuff. So you get repeat trials, but make sure that you feel comfortable fully expelling all of your air because that is how you get the most accurate reading from hydrostatic weighing. Next, we have plethysmography or bod pods or air displacement. I actually had one of these done when I was a freshman in college at Miami, and I have no idea what the reading was back then. I completely don't remember, <laughs> but I do remember getting it done. So this is similar to hydrostatic weighing, but it's just air displacement versus water displacement. This does have less subject error than hydrostatic weighing, just due to, or less subject error, I should say, than hydrostatic weighing, but the accuracy of a bod pod reading is largely dependent on the quality of the machine. These machines are very expensive and cheaper ones are going to give you a less accurate reading. They're going to have a larger margin of error. So the margin of error on something like a bod pod ranges from two to 4%, plus or minus two to 4%. Basically within a bod pod, it looks like a little egg uh, and you're basically just wearing tight fitting clothing. Uh, I think I had to pull my hair back and like have it in a cap of some kind. Uh, and then you just go sit in this little pod, they close the door and that's what happens. Um, if you're somebody that's claustrophobic, this might not be the best method for you because they are relatively small and you are in an enclosed space. Now, getting into the gold standard, the most accurate, the, what I would say best, in terms of just pure accuracy method of body composition measurement, we have DEXA scans. So DEXA stands for dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. So it does use X-ray to measure different tissues within your body. So this is considered a three compartment indirect model. DEXA scans use X-ray technology to measure your density and body composition based on how dark or how light the X-ray readings are. So in the next video, when we do go over my results, you will see like that little outline of my body <laughs> and how dark or light the readings are. So DEXA is the most accurate form of body composition measurement and it does measure bone mineral density, fat mass, and lean soft tissue mass. So DEXA scans measure bone mineral density, fat mass, and lean soft tissue mass. And when you get a DEXA scan, you get quite an extensive printout of all the different readings. It will measure like one limb versus the other. Like you'll get readings of like your right arm versus <laughs> your left arm versus your right arm, left leg versus right leg, trunk. It goes so far as to measure visceral fat, gynoid, like all of that. There's a lot. There's a substantial amount of data within a DEXA scan. And I love it. That's a part of why I love it as well. But DEXA is seen as the most accurate form of body composition measurement. And it generally has a low level of subject error just because you literally lay there. You lay on a table. It takes about six minutes. The thing passes over you very slowly to get the x-ray and that's about it. If you can lay still, you can get a DEXA scan. It's usually only in lab and research settings simply because DEXA scanning machines themselves are very like ridiculously expensive and the test itself is very expensive. Like I think the first test is like over a hundred dollars uh, depending on where you go. Now, 
a unique and valuable feature of DEXA scans is what I briefly mentioned before is they will measure measure things like visceral fat, which is like the fat surrounding your organs, um, not like the essential fat that you need surrounding your organs, but more of like that gut fat that's like very hard and more indicative of things like cardiovascular disease risk and just other disease risk. Uh, so this is generally the most unhealthy kind of fat as higher visceral fat amounts, like I said, are associated with an increased disease risk, potential pre-disease pre-disease states, things like that. It also, like I said, divides fat regionally, so you will get lots of breakdowns of just different fat and muscle tissue on different areas of your body, and you will get that bone density reading, so you know just how dense or potentially not dense your bones are, which is super important just for your overall health. So the accuracy of a DEXA scan is within plus or minus 1.7%. This has the lowest margin of error of any of the other methods that we've gone over in this video. One thing that I do wanna note with DEXA scans is that many people will read higher on DEXA scans compared to more traditional or older methods of body composition measurement. And I'm going to turn to the women's book by Lyle McDonald where he actually addresses this specifically on page 54. I'm just gonna read it verbatim. I do need to make an important point about DEXA relative to other methods as it pertains to how information later in this chapter and book will be presented. In many cases, I will recommend specific aspects of diet setup or other issues be based on starting body fat percentage. And the values I have traditionally used came from older methods such as calibers or a rough, rough visual assessment. This is important as DEXA seems to give systematically different numbers than those older methods in the realm of three to 6% higher. Demonstrating this, a number of top physique competitors have been measured via DEXA in contest shape, and invariably the values are at least 3% more than what calipers would put them at, i.e. a woman might be calipered at 10%, but DEXA would say she's 13% or higher. I don't honestly know what is responsible for this difference, and I don't think it matters in a practical sense. It simply needs to be recognized. When I provide some rough body fat percent for different goals below and present my category system, I will provide both the older method values along with adjusted DEXA values. So basically, what that means is DEXA scans will read you a little bit higher than what traditional methods of body composition measurement will. So if you, for example, go and get, like if you were to do this on the exact same day in the exact same conditions, let's say you had a DEXA scanner and a hydrostatic weighing tank and you did one right after the other, you may read higher on it. You very well may and likely will read higher on a DEXA scan. Part of me wonders if this is due to the increased accuracy or just the greater level of detail within different body tissues that a DEXA scan measures but I digress. To wrap up this video, I wanna go over a few of the factors that will go into and influence your body composition readings because this is really important, especially if you are someone that's going to get repeat testing. And if you're actually using this for data collection purposes, then you would want to get repeat testing done, right? So that you can compare and contrast. So this is something that I am taking into consideration uh, as I plan to get repeat DEXA scans done. So if you're gonna be a data nerd like me, getting just one test is not enough to paint the picture that you're looking for. So you're probably planning on doing multiple tests over time, just like with any scientific experiment, to ensure the accuracy of your data, you have to ensure the accuracy of your variables or your testing conditions to the best of your ability. So some things that are definitely going to impact your readings regardless of the method of measurement used, your hydration status, your meals. So example, if you were to do one DEXA scan on a completely empty stomach first thing in the morning fasted versus doing your following DEXA scan at the end of the day after like three or four meals, you're going to get very different readings. Or I don't necessarily know how different, but you're going to get different readings because you now have the variable of food that is uncontrolled. Other thing that will impact it is did you train that day? Another one for females is where are you in your menstrual cycle? So different points throughout your menstrual cycle will result in different fluctuations of total body water. So that will definitely impact your readings on just various types of body composition measurement. The practitioner, that's going to be a big thing. Um, even with something like a DEXA scan, you want to try and make sure that you have the same practitioner or at the very least you're at the same testing facility using the same machine. Um, so those are all some different factors, some different variables that you wanna try and control for to make sure that you are getting the most accurate reading possible. So for myself to ensure the most accurate readings possible, and I will reiterate this in the next video, uh, I will be doing successive tests just like I did this one. So I'll be fasted and in the morning, but with water, I drink a big glass of water every day when I wake up. This also ensures that I'm in a hydrated state. And then I also know personally, because water is very heavy, I will gain around three to four pounds of scale weight versus my fasting weight just from the amount of water that I drink in the morning before I go get my test. Uh, so that's something that I can account for when it comes to looking at like even just the scale weight reading at the facility. like. 
for example, if I were to, like the day of my test, I think I woke up on my own scale, I was at like 158 or something like that, drank a bunch of water, went and did my test, and I weighed in on their scale, which is obviously different than mine, uh, but I weighed in there, I think at like 161. Um, I don't have my papers right on me, but anyway. That way I know there's going to be some variability with that. Also, it will be around day 16 of my menstrual cycle because that is when I got my first DEXA skin done. So I'm going to try and keep around that time frame, which is I guess around the ovulatory time frame. Um, also making sure that I'm going to the same facility, making sure that I have not trained that day. If it's first thing in the morning and that's the first thing I'm doing, then I'll just go train afterward, that kind of thing. Uh, but just keeping testing conditions as similar as possible. Wow, this is definitely gonna be longer than 20 minutes. I'm going to wrap it up just for the background on different kinds of body composition measurement. I hope that has brought value to someone, uh, even if it's just learning something new, but also discerning like, hey, if somebody is taking my body fat in such and such a way, is that something that I can trust? You know, these skills that are super popular on Instagram, like should I be purchasing that? Should that be something that I'm spending however much they cost money on? Um, no. Just helping you discern what method of body composition testing might be best for you. Now something that I plan on doing more than likely when I start contest prep, um, Maybe when I go to get my next DEXA scan within the reverse diet, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm trying to coordinate with one of my old professors to do a video on just multiple different kinds of body composition measurements. So the ones that I have available to me, um, not at my university, but my DEXA scan was done somewhere else. Um, I'll put the name up on the screen if you are local, if you want to go and get one done. But at my university, we are able to do electro placement model for bioelectrical impotence. We are able to do skin folds, and I would say that my professor Jet was pretty darn accurate because he's done this for a while. Uh, and then also the hydrostatic wing, we are able to do that as well. So it might be fun to kind of compare and contrast just different readings from different forms of body composition measurement. Yeah, anyway, if that's a video you guys would be interested in, leave a comment below. But that is gonna be about it for me today. I hope you guys learned something fun and new and exciting and I will see you next time. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, like this video because I'm guaranteeing it took me a long time to do. <laughs> leave a comment below and I will see you guys later. Love you. Fat mass and fat, 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 f